it's got a safety profile of 10,000 years. I mean, people have been using cannabis, you know, all over the world successfully and safely. And, and for people that live with PTSD, it, it could be, well, it is a life-changing medicine because often these antidepressants come with suicidal ideation. Please advise. The content heard on this podcast is based on the opinions, experiences, and beliefs of the individual and or organization. Consult your physician to manage your medical condition and prescription. Trigger warning. The content heard on this podcast addresses the topics of death and experiences of rape. Viewer's discretion is advised. Welcome to Freedom to Know Wellness, where voices are heard. Seniors Voices Edition. Welcome to Freedom to Know Wellness. I am your host, Michelle Samuels. Today, we are continuing with our series called Seniors Voices, speaking with organizations that support seniors within the GTA, but today with a twist. Our guest speaker today is not just the owner and director of the Seniors Resources Organization, Bayview Concierge, but she is also advocates for the use of cannabis for seniors' health and individuals managing PTSD. Our guest today is Sherry Bennett. Welcome, Sherry, to the Freedom to Know Wellness podcast. How are you doing today? Thank you so very much, Michelle, for having me here today. I'm just truly honored to get to see you and and speak with you this morning. Yes, it's been a long time coming. We've been dialoguing back and forth for a bit. (laughs) And thank you so much for the support of this podcast. Yeah, I love what you're doing. I think it's so important. It's extremely important. Thank and, you. And that's, that's how we learn from others, from the voices of others, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so, exactly. So, so well done. Yeah. So Sherry, tell us a little bit about yourself and about Bayview Concierge. So um, yeah, my name is Sherry Bennett and I have um, a lot of experience in the medical community. I grew up in a medical family. And my dad was a doctor, sisters are nurses, grandmother was a nurse. And so uh, I I just was raised with uh, a mission to be of service to others. And um, actually I did uh, suffer a few uh, traumatic events and my doctors encouraged me to to start Baby Concierge as a referral uh, agency. To help, to help seniors, to help their families too, manage the well, what I call the logistics of life. Because sometimes when you know a loved one is ill and requires help, it takes it takes a village and it takes somebody to be an advocate. Um, so I started out doing that. I started out driving seniors to medical appointments, and uh, I would accompany them to their their uh, doctor visits and 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 help. Uh, be an advocate for them and uh, guide them to the right resources. But as you know, uh, many people are struggling financially right now. So a lot of these resources take and cost money. So, but I, I, I'm very grateful because during the course, I, I incorporated 12 years ago. So in 2012, I incorporated Bayview Concierge. And since then, I, it's been a journey, I'll tell you. I, I've, li- I've lived and learned a lot from the people I help and those who help me too, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But yeah, I love, uh, I, I love, I, I have a strong interest in people and also the survivor personality. It's just fascinating how, how people, what, what people can actually survive and heal from. Right? Yes, so, yes. So. I'm curious about some of the things that you've learned from the seniors that you've worked with. But before we go there, I've I've gone on your website to be able to learn more about Bayview Concierge. But uh-huh. what um, I just want you to share um, a little bit about what Bayview Concierge provides. Um, just referrals to seniors, and and mostly now it's not uh, individuals. I do individual counseling pro bono, but mostly now it's um, it's companies. I'm referring companies to other companies that help. So that's how it's evolved right now. And we're just, um, you know, I'm restructuring everything right now and uh, going to be doing events and events with uh, the focus of 
you know, healthy ways to heal from trauma, for instance. Mm. Um, so because a lot of times, you know, people, uh, if they don't get the correct help, they, they go down a road, they start drinking too much, for instance, or they start taking too many sleeping pills and, and things that are um, detrimental to their health. And, and so I believe these, these events too bring people together. A lot of, a lot of seniors are suffering from isolation. And, um, and, and we need each other. We can't go through life alone, really. And yes. we can't get through business alone either. <laughs> we need to help each other. It's hard. It's really hard. Right? So, yeah. And so what I've been doing lately is um, I talk to people all over the world through, um, through my podcast. And I'm also on others' podcasts, too. And I talk about my favorite subject which is medical cannabis treatment, uh, mm. specifically specifically for people like me who live with the diagnosis of PTSD. So many people don't know post-traumatic stress disorder is, is actually, um, the, well, the symptoms are, are debilitating anxiety, sometimes nightmares and flashbacks. And what well-meaning doctors do is they prescribe antidepressants and sleeping pills and um, tranquilizers. Mm -hmm. Well, those things all have side effects too. And then the doctors end up prescribing drugs to combat the side effects, right, of the, right. Of the pharmaceutical drugs. So I'm not saying pharmaceuticals are bad. They're, they're really good. But I believe now from my education, and from the last, I would say, eight years, I've been studying the medical science. And I've been taking medical cannabis every single day now for eight years. You know, sometimes I take a day off on the weekend. And uh, from what I've learned, it is um, the only medicine that does not come with the risk of life-threatening addiction or lethal overdose. And a lot of people don't know that. They right? don't. They don't. They don't. Yeah. And and when I went down that road and I went down the rabbit hole of of discovering the the the, the war on drugs, the, the reasons why this plant medicine was demonized in the first place, it's it's horrific. It, when you look at the history, you know, and it's only been the last ninety years that the plant has been. Um, maligned and misunderstood yes you know it's got a safety profile of ten thousand years i mean people have been using cannabis you know all over the world uh successfully and safely and um and for people that live with ptsd it, it could be um well it is a life-changing um medicine because often these antidepressants come with suicidal ideation they make, well, for me personally, they made me feel even more depressed. And I felt like I was a robot functioning. I was on, I think, Ativan for 20 years or something. Now, Ativan is a sort of like a tranquilizer. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and very addictive. But I was able to taper off that easily. And I, I don't take anything now. And uh, I use cannabis as topical cream, you know, if I ever have joint pain. Um, or on my face, you know, for, you know, wrinkles and, and mostly gel, gel, gel caps, you know, in the form of gel caps or, uh, yeah, topical cream and, um, and tea. Yes. And it comes in all, all forms. And, um, you know, we have, we have the evidence. I, I really get irritated when people say, oh, we don't have enough evidence or there's not enough, um, data. We have more, more, more published papers about cannabinoid medicine, cannabis, um, than we have on aspirin. We have more research, and I learned that actually from Montel. I don't know mm, if Montel told Williams. You. Yes, yeah, I, I don't know if I ever told you, but I, I learned so much from his podcast, and I love that guy. So he takes some um, uh, cannabis for his MS, multiple sclerosis. Yes. And so I actually introduced him to a few other um, patients who also have MS. So they were featured on his podcast too. 
So the reason I love to do that is because you you really you, you get to learn from everybody and and get to learn that well we're not alone in mm-hmm. in our you know and just because I have PTSD it's my my whole system is unique you know it's not I, I maybe not have the same symptoms of a, a veteran guy that just came back from combat you know but it's uh, it's something we have to start talking about now. But I, I trauma, think, trauma mm-hmm. is trauma, no matter which way you turn, right. mm-hmm. you know, and um, we won't go into detail of your experience, right. but it was very traumatic when, with what you've shared with me. It was very traumatic. Oh. And <clears throat> sorry, go ahead. Yes. Well, with your permission, this yes. is maybe a trigger warning for some. Yes, but, but we'll um, warn them. But mm-hmm. I, um, my dad was a doctor who died of AIDS in um, 1988. I don't know if I ever told you that. Or, no, you didn't tell no. he was, yeah, he was a physician and a lot of his patients were intravenous drug users. So I was really scared at that time, you know, and he'd come home and he'd say, oh, cannabis is the devil weed and it can cause, you know, it can cause you to start taking heroin and all these other drugs. It's a, it's gateway a, drug. It, yeah, 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 that was a mm-hmm. gateway drug. And over the years, I found out that, in fact, it's the opposite. It's an exit drug. It helps people reduce their opioid consumption and get off um, mm-hmm. all these dangerous drugs like heroin and, um, and whatever else they were taking in those days. So I was really fearful. But anyway, he, he was a good guy. In those days, in the 80s, nobody would come near us. We couldn't get doctors to come to the house. He was chief of staff at his local hospital. We couldn't get doctors or nurses or um, anybody to come. And luckily, one of my sisters is a nurse. So she organized us all and we did all the palliative care ourselves. And that was over a period of a year and a half. So um, and my grandmother was alive at the time. So she (laughs) she helped us, too. But I'm the oldest of six kids. And my sisters and brothers did most of the um, of the care for my my dad because I had two small babies at the time, so I was extremely anxious. And in those days, we didn't know about AIDS, and mm-hmm. they didn't have any of these antiviral drugs back then. I think they well, he 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 was put on AZT, a drug that's called AZT. Yes, I've heard of that. That's what I believe he died of now. Like thirty five years later, I believe it was the drugs that killed him, you know, um, or made his disease progress rapidly. So then, in between, um, we had uh, our grandmother uh, died, and my sisters and brothers did care for her too. And then my mother died of bone cancer. And they were in their 60s. They didn't make it to old age. My parents, my grandmother did, but my parents didn't. But um, it was, looking back, it was like an absolute privilege to be able to to care for them yes. when nobody else would. My mom, it was okay. She was allowed to go into the hospital and uh, get blood transfusions. My dad was not allowed to go to the hospital. They wouldn't let him in the hospital even. So yeah. even though he was a doctor who treated yeah. Yeah. AIDS patients, yeah, and unfortunately he ended up contracting AIDS yeah. himself. That's right. Now yeah. they're not going to take care of him. But this is the yeah. early. This was the mid '80s, '88. Oh, was, so yes, this was yeah. the height of it. Oh, it was just coming out, and everybody was terrified, and nobody wanted to come near us. And at the time when he died, um, I think my mom and my I know my mother and my sister had trouble finding a funeral home that would accept his body, even. Because in those days, it was just just fear. Like people didn't know. They thought you could get it from you know. We didn't know it's blood to blood contact, or um, or you know bodily fluids, saliva and mm-hmm. um, fluids, right? So uh, I know now a couple of men who have AIDS and they have been living you know happy lives because they have the the treatment available now. Right. Yes. Yeah. Because they, can... they didn't. Yeah. So that was the the first the first um, that was the first I would say the first uh, real shock. So and, sorry, not saliva, but through yeah. blood, through body fluids of blood semen. In other words, for contracting blood semen and sex, a sexual yes, trans- yes, yes, mm-hmm. sexual transmission. Yeah, yeah that and in, in those days in that hospital, 
I think there were two or three nurses and a couple of other doctors that got it, but they they said they lied. They said they had hepatitis because they didn't want to to um, you know be faced with the stigma. So we were very very um, open. My mother said, "Oh well, we have nothing to hide," and I wish she didn't because um, my dad would have got better treatment if if <laughs> we had to, we felt we had to be you know upfront and. Uh, Anyway, and he was in shock too. I remember he, he got tested like six times. Like, how did this happen? But in those days, general practitioners used to do their own blood work. Nobody wore gowns and gloves yes. and, and, uh, and masks, right? And it was completely different, a different time. Yeah, so I had two small babies at the time, and it was really, really hard. And, and I was working part-time. So if you want, with your permission, I'll go on. But yes, continue. More, if it's all right with yeah, you. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, after, when, after he died, I went, obviously we're all in shock. And I had these babies and I, was, I knew I was so depressed. I think my son was four and my daughter was two. So not babies, but like they were um, toddlers. And I knew I, I, I was really like a... Um, Operating like a like I said a, a robot because the the well-meaning doctors put me on antidepressants and um, I guess with the thought like medicate grief I was going through a tsunami of grief and and then my grandmother and my mother and then after my mother died then it was I think seven years after my dad died I'm not sure I can't remember maybe maybe five let's say five years. And um, yeah, just dealing with a tsunami of grief, I really couldn't function. And I knew I was not doing my children any favors, you know, hanging around the house, crying all day and not functioning well. So I went to another doctor. I went to um, a doctor that was recommended by a trusted friend of mine. And this guy was supposedly a specialist in grief counseling and and marriage counseling and and hypnosis or I don't know but the short story is that he drugged me and uh, sexually assaulted me in his office yeah and so that was like just that was the biggest monumental you know another shock to my nervous system mm -hmm. and to my whole um, so then it was like 10 years in court. 10 years um, with the College of Physicians and Surgeons. And um, the doctor got his license taken away. But he got it back again. You know, he got it back. I think six months later, he had to take a course on boundary violations or something. And it just wiped me out financially. Because he never went to jail. No, he didn't go to jail. He got his license back. And he was able to get his license um, to practice again. And um, and I did win a civil judge a civil uh, case against him, but um, I think the judgment was three hundred fifty thousand dollars. My legal fees were half a million, so it wiped me right out, it wiped me out financially. And then um, yeah, and then uh, I got divorced, and and so then I had a lot of wonderful people that helped me. What I did after the trial ended, it was I think two thousand and five said, okay, what the hell am I going to do now? So I started to volunteer at a women's shelter, um, the YWCA. And then also um, I worked in a funeral home. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> funny now. <laughs> Sounds really funny now, but I mm -hmm. thought, I don't know what I, I have all this experience in palliative care. So then I took a few courses and I, I became a bereavement counselor in our, a local funeral home. So I found, I, I didn't know what to do with my, but I thought that was the place for me to be right, <laughs> until right. I figured out my, till I figured out what to do with my life. And, uh, and I did focus on raising two happy, responsible children. And I did. So they live in different parts of the world now. They're in different cities, but they're, they're, they're thriving professionals right now. So I'm happy about that. but. When I look back, I think, oh, my goodness. But that's a place where, you know, people trust you with 
in the funeral home, I'm thinking, yes. with their their most raw um, moments in life. And and it's also a privilege to be able to to be to be there with them or just listen, just you know, provide a an ear and perhaps introduce them to somebody else who might have gone through the same thing. Because I, I do believe in in the power of a buddy system. Like yes. you need to have, we need to be able to talk, not to everybody, but just if we could find, you know, one person that we trust, just so we don't um uh we, we don't keep all the grief and and uh trauma inside. There's ways to healthy ways to to um to be able to to talk about it, and I and I do believe talking about it is better than 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 suppressing. Exactly, right? it can manifest itself in the body in so many different ways. Um, yeah. Even in chronic pain, with a lot of the chronic pain individuals, even cancer, you know, it's emotions, um, right. trauma. It can manifest itself in so many different ways in our body, and. It's interesting to note that what you went through, the loss of your father, yeah. the assault that happened to you, and the stress of just trying to combat um, yeah. that trial, you, yeah. it, you were probably probably already a compassionate and empathetic person already, but yeah. that just brought you to a next level that I believe like that, that the creator has allowed you to go through that to help others. I, I believe that too yeah. now because... Although I am not a doctor, I, I I believe I have a PhD in life experience. Exactly. You know, that's yeah. that's the way I frame it. And and I am very grateful. I lost all of my money. I lost I lost the savings, everything. Um, but I have the most wonderful people in my life. Um, men and women. And you know, there are it's usually one in three women. And I think they say one in seven men who are have experience with sexual violence. But but unfortunately, many populations are not even recorded in the stats, like the indigenous mm -hmm. population, for instance. So I tend to I do pro bono work for people that need a little direction. I don't I can't charge patients. I can't charge people that are um, looking for someone to talk to. So I, I talk to people and then I think, oh, who could, you know, I think about, I refer them to, because I know a lot of people now and a lot of um, really good uh, human beings. And, and, and we need to celebrate the good men in the mm -hmm. world. There's a yes. lot of bad men out there. <laughs> there are. But we have to, to find the good ones. And I have a lot of really good, uh, lovely men who have also helped women um, because violence against women is a man's problem, really. It just mm. that's my personal thing. Mm. So when we find the good men, it's um, it's uh, something that makes me very happy. I'm smiling because I'm thinking of some of them right now. Just yeah. lovely, lovely human beings, right? So, I, I think um, hurt people like to hurt people. And ah. yeah. I notice ah. hurt people like to hurt people. And when I see when, yes, it's more common that men do do the um, sexual assault on a women on women yeah. and children. But then also you have some women that do that. And you're thinking, my God, you know, women are supposed to be nurturers. But then you have some that go to that degree. And you're realizing right. there's some type of trauma that broke in them that they, instead of choosing like yourself to do good unto others, have decided to be able to create harm onto another person. Yeah, right. So with what the work that you've been doing with Indigenous, um, with the Indigenous community, um, with seniors, how have you found um, advocating, for example, speaking about seniors specifically, how have you found um, your advocacy work with seniors using cannabis for their wellness, for PTSD, or even for pain, for example? How, what's, what has your experience been in regards to encouraging them and your advocacy work, et cetera? Yeah, I, once again, I don't, I don't encourage anyone to take it, mm -hmm. but they come to me asking, you know, I'm thinking I can't sleep and my arthritis is bugging me a bit. So I point them in the right direction. 
And what I do is I tell them to first get a, a doctor's authorization. I send them to a website to get a doctor's authorization. And then I sort of coach them, like start very, very slow with a very, very low amount of uh, CBD and THC. We all need THC. Yes. And yes. the world, uh, people are afraid of that, that acronym, THC, because that's the molecule that is responsible for the psychoactivity. You take too much, it's not a happy, <laughs> it's not a happy ride, but bus ride. But the thing is, um, you're not going to die. No, so exactly. So I have to have this, I have to have this um, conversation. And sometimes they get to the place, like I usually say, give it three weeks. They get to a place where three weeks are getting a great night's sleep. It's wonderful. But then some may not be able to afford the, the capsules, you know, because that's, that's a big barrier. Patients have a constellation of obstacles, and one of them is um, uh, the cost of medical cannabis, and it's not covered. It's only covered for um, veterans. Veterans uh, get insurance coverage through Blue Cross here in Canada. So I'm trying to change that, too, uh, working with um, people I know in the federal government and in the provincial government. We need to have this necessary, I say it's necessary medicine uh, for some. We need it covered by insurance. We do. We do, because it's just, some seniors go without food so they can have their CBD tablets, right, or pills. That's not a good thing. Seniors, non-seniors, and I'm speaking from personal experience, Mm -hmm. when it's mandatory and your doctor is prescribed for you to take the CBD, the THC, to manage your chronic pain, to manage your insomnia, to manage PTSD. And then you're looking at it. And even though they may say, okay, you're going to get a little discount for those who are low income, it is still so expensive. I was in the hospital and the, my, my fibromyalgia was acting up so badly, no matter how much medication I said, you know what? Um, And they said, we don't want to put you on too much morphine. I said, well, they have me on, I'm prescribed a medical cannabis. And so the doctor went online. He had my laptop. He was helping me to apply and my hands were acting up. And so as he went to go look at the pricing, he said, oh my gosh, this Mm -hmm. is how much you pay. And I said, yes. And that's the discount. It's awful. And he's, and and he couldn't believe it. So he said, okay, Let's put you on um, the uh, pill form. I'm forgetting the name right now of what it's called. But I took the pill form, which is the made in the labs. Oh, and sounds- I had such a bad reaction. Yeah. I struggled with anxiety. Yeah. I was shaking. I was like, what is going on? And they right. said, okay, this is one of the side effects. I said, but when I take the oil, the cannabis oil, I don't go through that. Right. I feel normal and it right. helps. And I believe it's because it was probably either Sativex or Epidiolex or something. I'm trying um, to remember the name. Maybe Navalone, I'm not sure. Navalone, Navalone, that's what okay. it is, Navalone. Mm-hmm. So these are, um, uh, what they do is they isolate one single molecule. And what mm. we need is the full plant, full yes. spectrum. We need capsules and oil that has the whole entourage effect, all the the, uh, the terpenes and the other minor yes. cannabinoids in it. And I want to uh, I want to introduce you to Julie, my new friend in the Boston area, because she has a company. It's called Holistic Hemp Solutions. So she has found a way to I think it's cold processing uh, hemp cannabis, but with zero THC in it. So you get the benefits of all the you know CBD, CBN, and all the the precursor acids like the CBDGA and um, I don't know if you know those because cannabis. Yes, I do. Mm-hmm. You do. Yes, mm-hmm. I do. Tell. You, it's it's like four hundred different molecules. Yeah. So really, it's not like oh, take an aspirin and call me in the morning. And because each human being has our own specific endocannabinoid system. And so like we all, every human being, we all have fingerprints, right? Mm -hmm. So not one of us is the same. Not So our endocannabinoid systems are just as unique. So we need to be able to find a way to rule this in, rule it out. And nobody knows your body better than you, right? So it's a matter of working with your health healthcare practitioners and perhaps um, 
a coach or somebody that has um, taken cannabis before and, and, you know, you know, as a guide, but everybody's different. And some people love to inhale it because that is the quickest method of, uh, you know, of, of dosing it, of getting the medicine in there and relief. So you can never tell some people can't, you know, you got to quit smoking. Veterans, for instance, they need it. They need to, uh, my friends that are in severe pain, they need to, um, they need to smoke it because it's instant relief, instant effects. When I take capsules, um, for me, I'm in my 60s. It could take an hour and a half or so for me to feel the effects. I had an 85-year-old client. It took her four hours to feel the effects. Same CBD capsule that I was giving her with um, THC. Oh, and by the way, I can't sell anything. I'm not allowed to sell anything. So sometimes I gift people a sample of my medicine that I take, right? Because I have to do everything in accordance yes. with the laws. And um, and that's another conversation too. The laws need to be changed. And mm. They do. I'll have and, you back on for that. <laughs> yeah. Because, um, that. And, I, and, I, and what I did lately is, um, so I was focusing on my podcast. I have a podcast called Let's Talk Cannabis yes. with Doctors. So I was focusing on, you know, gathering all the information from doctors. It's like a conversation, doctors and patients. And uh, my co-host is Dr. Barbara Mainville, who is a wonderful, wonderful woman with 30 years experience as a coroner in the province of Ontario and emergency room physician. And she has also prescribed cannabis for her patients for the last decade or so. So she understands the human body more than most doctors in the world and most actually i would go so far as to say all the people on my podcast and on montel podcast know more about cannabis medicine and how it affects the human body than most doctors in the world yes and that's very sad yeah. you know because the human endocannabinoid system although it was discovered in 1988 it's still not yet taught in med schools. So, yeah, let's think about this. So that means to me that our doctors are not being given the correct factual education about a monumental part of human physiology. Like the endocannabinoid system is the largest modulating system in the human body. It's responsible for balancing our digestive system, our respiratory system, our uh, endocrine system, um, immune system, CBD, you know, and so that's why CBD and THC work so well. Oh, anti-inflammatory benefits. Yeah, the anti-inflammatory benefits. And, um, and so yeah, it's, it's a scary thing that our doctors are missing this critical education. So what we're trying to do now through our voices, through our podcasts is link everybody together and and the doctors are learning from us the patients mm -hmm. really. it's, you know, tr it's true it's true because they can't uh, i'm wondering if i have that like i don't know i kept no doctors doctors the way they find out about medicine is through the pharmaceutical companies you know they print the they print their prescription pads and in between there's little advertisements for the pharmaceuticals or that in the compendium of pharmaceuticals, that big book that doctors get with all the drugs. Um, yeah, that's how they learn about drugs. They're not really taught about drugs too much in, in med school either. So, uh, but now there is, they need to be able to um, advise their patients about drug interactions. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, a lot of seniors take um, blood thinners, for instance. So CBD is not a good thing to take with blood thinners, you know. So we need to we need to have that information, or the doctors need that information, mm -hmm. and um, anesthesiologists need to know if one is taking cannabis or not. And the stigma is still alive and well here in the GTA. Right I, I didn't know that if you're taking cannabis and you see the anesthesia, oh, because it drops the heart rate even lower. Or it depends on the amount of, like, I broke my arm once. 
So I, mm -hmm. I told the guy when he was going to set my arm, he'd have to put me on some heavy duty um, drugs to knock me out. Right. So he was happy that I told him that I had uh, cannabis because he has to adjust the anesthetic. He may have to give me less or more. Everybody's different, but they need to know. Right. Right. And and, and it's just like um, doctors should be able to have a conversation with their patients. Like they say, how much alcohol do you consume in a mm -hmm. day? Do you consume cannabis? Because a lot of seniors are afraid to, to, to even tell their doctor that. Um, there's still the stigma is just... The stigma is still there. But mm -hmm. at my cannabis clinic, when we were allowed to go in, now everything's mm -hmm. done online. Mm -hmm. um, or we do it as a telephone appointment. But before when mm -hmm. I would go in and I remember bringing my father, I said, mm -hmm. look at the patients that are here. They were all seniors. Yeah. Some of us were my age, but yeah. all of them were seniors. You can see they were struggling with their mobility and different issues. But right. my father's like, really? I said, this is why it's so important. It is help for the, for, helpful for the pain. And you're not having to take such harsh medications that are causing more damage to your organs, to your liver. I know a friend of mine, she had to have um, a transplant, a liver transplant, because of the amount of drugs that she was taking. It couldn't filter anymore. Right, right. You know, so just finding more natural options to be able to manage pain, manage sleep, manage depression. Right. So when you say that the seniors can't even afford, because I can, I, I have to be trying to figure out cheap ways to do things, yeah. you know, whether it's even to grow your, for yourself a few, I think um, it's legal for, if you have a medical prescription to grow three plants, mm -hmm. just to try and grow and supplement it because it's very expensive. And to right. hear that seniors are not able to afford this medication that they need to be able to manage yeah. their elderly lives. Yeah. That's not good. It's really not good. And, and, you know, it, really what cannabis helps the THC helps the most is the sleep. And when you suffer from sleep disruption, no. you can't heal from anything, right? No. You need sleep. Yes. So just for that one, you know, just to take it as a replacement for sleeping pills, for instance, and, and one doesn't wake up groggy and feeling hungover, as long as they don't take alcohol or sleeping pills with mm -hmm. their cannabis. Mm -hmm. If they take just cannabis, it's... Um, Oh, it's a lot safer, and um, and it's like I said, it 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 doesn't it doesn't affect the part of our brain that tells us when to breathe or not. So that's the difference between cannabis and opioid medication. So if I take too many Tylenol threes or uh, too much uh, morphine or any of the or too many sleeping pills, benzos or anything my brain tells my respiratory system to shut down. And unfortunately, that's how so many people now are dying of accidental fentanyl. Overdose. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Because the fentanyl, one granule can kill, can put you to sleep. And, um, and cannabis, you know, is, and, and as long as it's clean. Like I also tell people, I have seniors, they're getting cannabis from their grandchildren. <laughs> so, no, 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 no. You know, or getting it from their kids. Um, make sure you get your um, get clean, tested yes. cannabis, and don't get it from Smiley on the street corner because you don't know, <laughs> you don't know where um, what's in that. When you have, when you get it from a regulated, licensed producer, yes, you have a certificate of analysis and you know it's clean. And if you know how to grow it then that's good. But you got to know how to grow it. Yes. And make sure it doesn't have any pesticides or contaminants in it that mold, for instance. And so you got to really know what you're doing. If, uh, or you have to trust somebody that knows what they're doing. To, it's, you know. Yeah, it's a learning process. It is. It definitely is a learning so, process. So, I mean, there's layers and layers of conversations we could have just around this one plant. But I'll tell you, um, nobody in the history of 10,000 years has died from cannabis. And then there's a joke going around saying the only way is if somebody threw a bale of it out of a plane and it hit you on the head or something like that. <laughs> you know, a bale of cannabis coming out of a plane, that's the only way it could die. Because when you understand how it works with our, um, our human bodies, then it, it's very different. And 
yeah, it, you, I could be addicted. I want to be. I choose to have cannabis in my system every day. So one would say you're addicted, and I say, yeah, I choose that because I feel it helps me with focus and productivity. Um, and and I also have a diagnosis of ADHD too. So what doctors prescribe for that is, you know, it makes salts, amphetamines like Ritalin or Adderall. Okay. So for people with ADHD brains, like brains are <laughs> are like always on hyper, like we're going all the time. So it it helps to settle down my brain in order for me to be able to to focus. Right. And and to talk without to talk about some some stuff that that normally or would have you know put me put me under the covers for three days before it's easier for me to be able to talk about things um that without getting like swept up in the emotion that's what i'm trying to say i understand it keeps you more it stabilizes you that's it it Mm -hmm. stabilizes mood it like a cbd particularly it, it helps the immune system too people don't realize that People that take cannabis and CBD had less COVID or less severe symptom of COVID. And uh, it, and also for people like that are suffering from uh, dementia, for instance, what CB does, uh, CBD does is it promotes uh, new brain cells. They call it neurogenesis. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't, but Dr. Barb and all the doctors describe it on my podcast, but yeah, it's, it's something we need to talk about because it's, um, I want to, you know, the, the, the opioid crisis is now killing 25 Canadians a day, accidental. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And these are children, um, adults, seniors, all of the above. It can happen to doctors, nurses, you get addicted very, very quickly, you know, to like, for instance, if I have kidney stones, I want to be begging for morphine. I want morphine. I want Tylenol 3s. I want Tylenol 4s. Yeah, but five days. I would say short-term opioids are really good. And then after, try to wean a little bit off and add cannabis into your treatment protocol. I'd say never get off your meds, but just add a little bit on. And and if you give it three weeks and you, you really pay attention, you you can... Um, have have success yeah well that's what a lot of doctors are realizing now and like that's what I was giving you that example is that they didn't want to keep me on the morphine too long and so they said okay go back to your cannabis use but again it was quite pricey but at one point I just said me just bite the bullet and just buy it because that nabalone was giving me such negative side effects so regarding you stating that you're able to um or at least direct uh, many seniors to cannabis organizations that will be able to help them. Now, if seniors wanted to be able to contact you pertaining to how they can be directed, would that be through Bay- Bayview Concierge? Yes, or they can, um, I'm usually, I'm on LinkedIn and, and Facebook. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times I get <laughs> I get uh, messages through the back end of LinkedIn or, or Facebook, that sort of thing, or um or people can just email me if they want okay. at sherry at bayviewconcierge.ca. Yeah. Sherry yeah. at bayviewconcierge.ca. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I'm seeing the services, financial, health, and wellness. So obviously with the cannabis use, that would be health and wellness, home living, legal. This is a, it's a great website. What you guys are offering in regards to referrals for seniors to be able to receive services and to assist them. And yes, it does cost money. So with um your with your clientele with Bayview um concierge, mm-hmm. which the website um uh, to my listeners, it's bayviewconcierge.ca. Um, have you found that you've um only been able to assist um like a middle class and higher, or are you able to assist low income seniors as well? Because I know things are expensive. Um, it's mostly low income senior, and that's why I do it pro bono. Ah. But they sometimes get it, it depends on the situation. Sometimes get the people that have access to resources to help somebody else in need, sort of thing, or offer. Uh, I I just try to like you know, every every situation is unique, and so some people can afford it. 
even even the ones that can't afford it don't really want to pay for it either because cannabis medicine is taxed yes right so they would rather get it i'm telling you they'd rather get it from the indigenous growers that i know so i point them there Mm -hmm. Um, some some but um I, I make sure I've done all the vetting. I check out every single company that I refer to, and I want to make sure that everybody gets clean, tested cannabis medicine. Mm-hmm. So our indigenous population, they don't operate in the same uh, under the same. They have different laws, and unfortunately, when our government was developing the Cannabis Act, they didn't even they didn't even and consult with our indigenous populations. And and in Canada, you know, our, our indigenous populations know a lot about plant medicine. Mm. Uh, it should have at least been included. I think that's changing now, but um, yeah, the laws are the laws, in my opinion, are criminal. Not the people, it's the laws that are criminal. When you look deep down and you understand the history, it's just it's just horrifying. And then when people learn that, they are horrified and they, they, well, you know, the damage done by prohibition has been comprehensive. So we really need to start talking about how to heal from this horrible war on drugs. Because the war on drugs was a war against traumatized people in Canada and the United States. It it was war against traumatized people. It was war against racialized people. Yes. I find the Black, Indigenous the Mexican yep. communities, this, yep. all of these communities, even Asian communities were affected yep. by, you know, yes. they were using their medicine and then, no, you're not allowed to carry it anymore. You're not allowed to grow it. No, oh, this, is, this is so horrible. And you're right. And mostly black and Hispanic families were ruined in like in the last 90 years. And then the, all because of one extreme racist guy in the US and here in Canada, we had our own share. And mostly here in Canada, it was um, Asian people that were uh, particularly affected and blamed for the opium dens and things like that. Please note, Sherry and I cut this part of our conversation short to remain on topic. As beforehand, we had discussed in length our mutual disdain for racial profiling and the high incarceration rates for minor cannabis possession against Blacks, Indigenous, and other peoples of color throughout North America. But watch until the end, or skip to the timestamp, Racist History, the Criminalization of Marijuana, for this brief overview. I I really think that story needs to come out, and there's some really good uh, documentaries. Uh, Like, for instance, The Cannabis Question, I believe that's on YouTube or something. And, you know, outlining how the damage has just been horrific. And it's all you know ignorance just real ignorance and and non-scientific racist propaganda that we were all fed to believe all of us were brainwashed like my dad you say oh cannabis is going to lead to it's a gateway drug it's going to lead to this no we have the evidence now that it is not and and we got to we got to figure out how to heal that systemic you know the, the laws, the laws are horrific right now. So now I don't know. It's slowly happening, but not fast enough. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Not fast enough. And in the meantime, we have all these people dying of fentanyl overdose. So we have to start the conversation. And I'm very grateful that you're letting me talk about this because people don't want to talk about trauma. And but we got to think about the future of our our next generations. So I'm assuming, I was going to ask with all the services that baby concierge have provided to serve the the seniors community, I'm assuming the health and wellness has probably been the most that you've been proud of? It's the most. And it's mostly, I feel feel like I'm a, a, what do I call myself? Like a a medical, medical knowledge broker. So like, or like, and even companies that need um that need hvac systems or something or uh or i i refer i just i think i know if i don't know the answer to something i know the doctors or the team of researchers that know the answer 
or that are working on the answer. And I know the there there are a lot of doctors now that are specializing in helping people with well MS, for instance, neurologists and and yeah, I don't know. It's a big mix of things because everybody is different and every situation is different. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's why I've focused on mostly, I think I'll be out speaking more and organizing events where we bring doctors on my stage from all over the world. I don't really like to travel too much. And that's that's a symptom of my PTSD. I'm always like I feel like I'm always sitting with my back to the wall. Okay. I, I'm mm -hmm. still I still suffer from you know when I'm out in public I'm in hyper alert mode you know in fight or flight mode. That's what mm -hmm. I'm trying to say. So I I'm always I, I feel better when I can be in my home office or in my you know community, um, and and people come to me so I don't have to travel. <laughs> oh dear. Out of curiosity, I know in the medical community, they have also integrated psychedelics like medical mushrooms to be able to help with PTSD, different um, chronic pain um, conditions. Have you had any experience with this? Um, have you ever been prescribed this as an um, option? Yes, yeah, so psilocybin is something yeah, psilocybin, I'm really yeah. interested in. I have never tried it yet, but I want to. Mm -hmm. And but I want to do it under supervision. You know, people um, people I know and I know how to get clean tested psilocybin, and I know people who need it. Uh, for instance, my my friend. Oh, you'd love to see to maybe talk with her too, Allison Murden. She's a retired law enforcement officer who lives with MS too, and she's on Montel. If ever you want to listen to Allison Murden. Look at Montel's podcast, and you'll hear her talk about how um, psilocybin helps with her her pain. Um, I for, I can't pronounce the pain she has. It's something called uh, something facial um, try general try general neurology or something. I can't pronounce. I know what you're speaking but, about, but I'm yeah. not going to attempt to pronounce it myself. Yeah, I, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, just, I made a message. But I've heard about, what you're. I've yeah. heard of what you're speaking about. But yes. yeah, so people do heal from that. I really want to try um, to try that, but mm -hmm. I want to do it under like a doctor's supervision because I think you can go and take some small doses and then you're like monitored for eight hours. I yes. wouldn't want to do it alone, or I'd want to do it with somebody who is um, experienced and somebody that I trust. Because they can prescribe someone to sit with you. They have, um, it's a website. And oh my goodness, when I can, I'm going to look it back up. I went to a convention and I met uh, a group of women um, and they were explaining to me about the different organizations that they provide to help for people who are trained to sit with people when they're going through a psilocybin trip or whatever you want to call it, to be able to go through the process, help them to work through the process and um, it's amazing things that they're doing to helping people medically managing, you know, the trauma, um, physical pain, et cetera. So yes, it's important. Don't do it alone or else. I've heard yeah. some horror stories. <laughs> yeah. No, I want to, I'm really, really interested in it. But again, it costs money. It's very yes. expensive yes. to get yes. to do it that way. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, so, but, but we have to start these conversations too and get the government moving because we have now um, generations of people that are highly traumatized, not getting the right care that they need. And now we have other people coming from different parts of the world that are coming with their own trauma. So we need to be able to take care of those people too, somehow. Um, and, and nobody's thinking about that right now. But I'm, I'm very concerned um, because um, I have at least, um, well, at least, 19 or 20 friends that have lost their children to accidental fentanyl overdose. Oh my God. And these kids could be in their teens or 30s, but it's still their children. Mm -hmm. And so, what does that do to the whole family? As yes. you know, it affects the whole family, everybody, grandparents, you know, and, and then you, as also, we know that you, you don't recover from, from that sort of thing with with ease it's an ongoing um you have to manage the hole in your heart you know mm -hmm. and, and it's a hard way to live 
So we need community. We need people that understand, that are trauma informed, that we can talk to. Just, I think that just like, um, like has having a buddy system or having somebody to be able to talk to is, is a big, a big relief. Yeah. You made a great point in regards to with new immigrants coming here, um, Mm -hmm. especially if they've come from war-torn countries. Um, There was a lady I had met, I think she was from the Congo, and we were at an event and there were um, fireworks going off. And so she was, she was seizing and I looked at her and I said, are you okay? She goes, I know it's fireworks. And she just kept saying, I know it's fireworks. I know it's fireworks, but all it's reminding me of the gunshot she was experiencing where she was in the war-torn area, I think within the Congo, um, that she had experienced. So you're making a lot of sense. A lot of people are coming here with different Mm -hmm. traumas that they need the support. Right, and we Mm -hmm. need the support in the workplace too, Mm -hmm. because somebody might be a victim of uh, domestic violence or coming into the office and behaving in a different way. And we need people around in the workplace that are in the government, it's a big word now, trauma-informed, to be trauma-informed. It's like a, it's an ethical competency. So we need to teach our senior managers and government officials, they need to think about this now because there is so much going on. And, and the COVID pandemic just blew everything up. Like it just put everything in the spotlight. The dysfunction, the, the isolation that seniors and others go through. And uh, yeah, and so I'm I'm trying to, you know, change the narrative in the media from carnage to cannabis. Let's start having a conversation to settle everybody down. There's all these wars going on all over the world. That's not, you know, there is. I don't see any solution until we can tell people to settle down. When these soldiers are fighting in fight or flight mode, like filled with rage, anger, and fear blowing up, you know, people and places and, and then other people are escaping, we, we have to settle everybody down so we can talk about how to, how to you know, move forward because it's, uh, it's something that is, it's, it's on my mind a lot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because when people get so anxious and depressed and then they turn to maybe too much alcohol, too much sleeping pills and, and drugs, and, and now we're finding, you know, a lot of talk about medical assistance in dying. Mm-hmm. I I like to talk about medical assistance in living, and that's what I think cannabis is, and I think psilocybin is too. And you'll be the first one to know if I ever try it. I want to come back and talk to you again. Yes, because please. <laughs> I, something I'm really wanting to try, and and I I I just have to say for myself. I've had such success. Like I didn't, I had moments where I really didn't really want to live too. This is not recent, but since taking cannabis, it, it, it's not the, it's not the magic bullet, but it sure helps people become friendly with life again. That's how I describe it. Mm-hmm. You know, it helps me. Um, it's a tool in my toolbox. It helps me cope with, with life. Yes. You know? And you know, life is not easy. Right? No, it's not. It's not always easy. It's no. int- as you said that um, with cannabis, it's everyone's canna- uh, cannabinoid system is different. So mm-hmm. for some people, it can make them feel great. For some people, it can make them feel like, oh my gosh, I'm losing my mind. I've heard some people say that. I'm like, yeah. oh really? But I guess it's however our brains. It's just like regular medication. Certain medications work best for some people. Certain medications doesn't. So with some people's THC makes them feel. Right. loopy but cbd is fine you know right. or they can take the thc on their skin uh, a cousin of mine with fibromyalgia she's like oh my goodness i can't ingest i can't smoke or ingest the oil for thc to send her off but i made the oil for her uh-huh. helped her so oh, everyone's right. different and it's realizing that yeah right. but the fact that it's caused you to have the joy of life to be able to manage life better and you know the fight yeah. for life i like the way you right. had said that i'm not saying exactly as you said it but the fight for life. It's like, yeah. that's what we, the right for life. Yeah. And everybody has the right to a better quality of life. Yes. And that's what cannabis gives us. But the government is not letting us because it's, there's too many barriers. Taxes, They're making money off of it. Money. And, and then, and so, 
And that's exactly what the, the provincial government has done here in Canada. We have uh, more cannabis stores than we do the coffee shops, you know, in, in certain communities in, in, uh, in uh, Ontario. And yeah, okay, but the thing is, people need to understand how to, to use it, how to consume it, and not to take too much THC if they have, you know, if they've had a bad experience before. Ease into it. And um, and the difference between medicine and poison is dosage. So one has to learn what their sweet spot is, what their correct dosage is. Yes. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time, you know, three three or four weeks or so to get to get, you know. So mm-hmm. you know, there's lots of lots of things to talk about, but <laughs> I. I I just like to put all the people that I know together. And now there's some that were on my, my podcast that are doing documentaries. And so that makes me so happy. That's what makes me the happiest is when I put people together and it works. Right? <laughs> this business with that business and they complement each other. Yeah, that's what makes me the happiest. is Because I think in pictures and I'm always, um, you know, thinking about how do we solve this puzzle? Of, of repairing the damage that all these horrible laws have caused yeah. and and how to repair well I think it's impossible in, in some in some ways but I, I it's just sick I know some family I don't know one family but mom is working in a legal cannabis store and daddy is still locked up in jail for simple possession that is obscene in this day and age in 2024 you know, these people should be out, pardoned, you know, as long as it's nonviolent, you know, it just, it, it's just, there are so many injustices around this topic. It's, uh, and, and we, we, we can't fix it unless we start talking about it. You know? that, may, that, having, that makes my blood boil. I know. So many people oh, I know yeah. just for carrying a little bit of cannabis, yeah. a little bit of weed, as they would say. And they're going to jail for it. Oh, and I'm horrific. like, really? Horrific. Yeah. No, but anyways, horrific. I want to get your final thoughts <laughs> as we're about to close. Uh, first of all, what advice would you give to seniors transitioning into retirement? With your experience with baby concierge and all you've been doing, what would advice would you give to seniors transitioning? Well, it depends on their financial, you know, so I would say low if income to mid, even middle if they're, class. Yeah, low, I would say, you know, try to volunteer. It sounds a very weird thing, but try to volunteer for your local women's shelter or, or maybe, um, maybe a hospital rocking babies, premature babies or something. I don't know, but something to take the focus off is that's what helped me when I was going through all the horrendous, if you put the focus on trying to help someone else, then it just opens up a whole new I would say try to get out and volunteer if if you're physically able and um, or get on the phone maybe and, and be a support to somebody else if you could. Because everybody has value when they start to talk about their their wisdom and life experience. And you know, I think that's that's just the first thing that came to mind. But mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Volunteering, no matter who you are, volunteering, if you're mm-hmm. unemployed, what have you, it adds so much to your roster. And it's not just the roster, it's about giving back to people, integrating yeah. with people, learning from other people's experience. Yeah. It it, yeah. it makes you feel that feel good feelings inside, but more so it just expands your horizons. So I right. agree with you. Right. And um, you mentioned about the advice you give to seniors um, regarding cannabis, cannabis for health related reasons but um what advice would you give to ptsd sufferers when considering cannabis as a treatment yeah you gotta like do everything in your power to be able to um sort of use other tools to help too like maybe meditation prayer whatever is good for you to help settle your um because what happens you have a that your brain gets dysregulated and it's really hard even to talk to somebody when they're in active, when they have active PTSD symptoms. So 
So you try to get people to calm down and then like they have to, I don't like to force them into making a decision to take cannabis, but here, if you want, I can guide you through it. And we go slowly and, and then, and then keep the conversation going. <laughs> you know, I like to talk to people along their journey because they say, oh, well, I didn't feel this, or maybe, um, well, maybe I didn't take too much, or maybe I took too much or too little, or it's again unique to to each individual and what what one is going through, but it's really hard. I think when we're saying about all these, you know, the politicians are saying we need more homes and everything. Yeah, what are people going to do in their homes if they're all traumatized or afraid to go out or afraid, and they come with um, maybe some anger and hatred towards those they were escaping from? And how do we we need to have more more focus on community and helping people heal, you know? And and so I I, I really can't answer that question well. But no, I think you've you've stated you've made some valid points in that last statement. And are there any last words for our listeners? I just know that there is hope for a better future. And if we find people like you, I'm so grateful for you and what you do. What you do is so incredibly important because by using this forum, your voice can travel a lot further around the world than it can if you're just talking to me. And I want to introduce you to Montel too. Yes, that would be great. <laughs> he is such a great guy. And he, he, he's doing a lot of really good work for educating doctors, educating patients and doctors around the world. So I invited them to come to Richmond Hill. When he does, I'll be sure invite you to come too. But that's my that's my vision and my mission. That's what keeps me keeps me happy to bring you know good people here to help us tell the story, help us you know tell the 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 benefits of this sacred plant that has been maligned and misunderstood for the last ninety years, but it has a safety profile of ten thousand years. Mm -hmm. And so nobody knows about it because the stupid laws and pro propaganda. So it has to be up to us to spread the word and, and, and join our voices together. Yes. That's what I like to do. Yes. Join our voices together. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you again. And just to remind our listeners, uh, where can people find you on social media? On uh, LinkedIn, uh, Sherry Bennett, medical cannabis educator. And on Facebook, and if you just type Sherry Bennett, I'm sure you'll find me. There's I'm the only one that talks about uh, cannabis. I have a I don't have it with me right now, but I'm the only one that has a THC symbol on my business card too. A lot of people are afraid to do that, but I'm I'm out there. And the name I, of your podcast again for your the uh, name of the business? podcast is Let's Talk Cannabis with Doctors. And it's on Spotify and or Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to your podcasts. And yeah, we'd love it if we get more and more listeners and pass it around to your doctors and lawyers. <laughs> we, need, we need the lawyers more than ever now in the next decade or go to, to figure out how to repeal the laws. And if you want to contact um, Sherry directly as well via email, if you go to the bayviewconcierge.ca and go yeah. under, I believe it is contact, you'll be able to um, send her a message via there, correct? Yes, that's right. Or, uh, or my other website is letstalkcannabis.ca. I like that one. That's, <laughs> that's a good media articles. I like that. Yeah. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Thank Sherry, you. thank you so much again for being on the Freedom to Know Wellness podcast. This has been an informative and I believe helpful to our listeners episode. This that you have been disclosing has been encouraging to me and to know that other people are advocating for the wellness of all people, seniors, non-seniors, low income, what have you, and for our mental wellness and yeah. physical wellness. So thank you. As I like to close, reading information is one thing, but listening to a person's lived experience is another and paramount. And that's what we do here at Freedom to Know Wellness. Thank you again and be well. Canada's legalization of marijuana now allows for easier access, especially for the medical benefits for adults and seniors and prescription access to CBD for children with seizures. But before the legalization of marijuana, 
Canada's opioid laws were founded on racist, xenophobic beliefs. Similar to the United States marijuana prohibition in the early 1900s was based on anti-Mexican immigration and brown and black xenophobic ideologies, Canada's 1908 Opium Act originated from Vancouver's anti-Chinese immigration laws. In the 1800s, Chinese railroad workers used opioids to treat their physical pain and aid in relaxation. This law was created based on the belief that the Chinese migrants' lifestyle was harmful to the white habitants and a strategy to halt Chinese immigration. These beliefs ran simultaneously with the then-current Anti-Indigenous Indian Acts and anti-Black racism already prevalent throughout Canada. Canada's Opium Act of 1908 was the beginning of police racial profiling and harsh prison sentences against people of color and cascading worse on the Black and Indigenous demographic. Prior to legalization, those arrested for minor marijuana possession offenses in Canada were primary Black people or Indigenous people, according to data published in the International Journal of Drug Policy. Four out of five of the cities in this research, both Indigenous and Black people, were the highest arrest rates. In all five of the cities examined, Black people were overrepresented among those arrested for low-level possession up to 30 grams. In 2017, the Toronto Star examined 10 years from 2003 to 2013 of Toronto police data and found that Black people with no criminal record were three times as likely to be arrested for cannabis possession than white people with no prior charges. Rates of cannabis use were about the same for Black and white Canadians. Marijuana usage and its effects on certain ages, driving, etc. is one thing. But when a criminal system is founded on racism, its xenophobic ideologies on set races of people will continue to impact the legal system generationally. It's taken over 100 years since this opioid law was founded for us as a country to understand that this law and other judiciary legislations were often rooted in racism, negatively impacting, in multiple ways, people of color. On August 1, 2019, Canada declared Bill C-93, an act to provide no costs expedited record suspension for simple possession of cannabis. People can now apply to have their minor possession record expunged. The only caveat is, if you have any other criminal convictions apart from simple possession, whether drug-related or not, you will be denied. Again, a judicial system having roots in racism has led to many people of color having additional criminal charges on their record, whether innocent or not. So how does this new program help? Whether you agree with me or not, I state all of this for you to ruminate on and to see the faults in the system. Research has shown that cannabis has several benefits, from pain relief for conditions like fibromyalgia, other arthritic conditions, autoimmune diseases, endometriosis and menstrual pain, anxiety disorders, to treat tremors in Parkinson's disease, combat nausea for chemotherapy treatments, and more. Endocannabinoids are found naturally within the human body, carrying the cannabinoid receptors CB1 and CB2, which are compounds already found in the cannabis plant. A small fact, minor endocannabinoids are found naturally in mother's milk. Endocannabinoids are essential functions towards learning and memory, emotional processing, sleep, temperature control, pain control, inflammatory and immune responses, and eating. As research continues, we will learn even newer discoveries on the benefits of cannabis as a natural treatment for various conditions and the links between the cannabis plant and the human body. Find all article links discussed in this episode below. Thank you for watching this final episode from the Freedom to Know Wellness 2024 Seniors Voices series. Freedom to Know Wellness provides online seniors resources for services available in the Greater Toronto, Ontario region. Find this link below. Seniors Voices and the rest of FTK Wellness's podcasts depends on the donations and sponsorship of our viewers. We ask if you can please contribute to this content creation. FTK Wellness pays Seniors Voices guests who share their stories without being interviewed 
a stipend to aid their financial situation. If you wish, you can request for your contribution to be designated towards Seniors Voices Stories. Send your contribution to paypal.me forward slash F as in Frank, T as in Tom, K as in Kite, Wellness. Thank you again and be well.